Hello and welcome to my presentation about Load Balancing Exchange. In this presentation we will have a look at Load Balancing Exchange 2010 and Exchange 2013. First the agenda. We start with a short introduction, then we have a look at the Load Balancing Essentials, followed by Load Balancing Exchange 2010 and finally Exchange 2013. Questions can be asked by using the comments below. My name is Johan Veldhuis. I'm working as a technical consultant in the Netherlands. I'm a contributor to several blogs, among them SimpleTalk and several Dutch websites. And I'm also a contributor of the UC Architects podcast. So what is Lobelsing? When you look at several websites, you will find several, well, descriptions of it. And one of them is this route workload across multiple servers to achieve optimal resource utilization, maximize throughput, minimize response time, and avoid overload. Often, application delivery controller is used to refer to load balancing. Why should you use load balancing? Well, there are two main points. You can increase the capacity and you can increase the high availability. You can increase the capacity by placing more servers behind the load balancer. So you will be able to handle more traffic. By placing more servers behind the load balancer, we can achieve a better high availability solution. You've got multiple servers, so if one of the servers fails, the load balancer will redirect the traffic to the other server. Which other options are available when using load balancing? Well, think of SSL offloading. This gives you the ability to SSL offload the traffic to the load balancer. The second one is maintenance mode. You can put a cache server in maintenance mode via the load balancer. This will ensure that no traffic will be sent to the cache server. Caching. This is especially interesting for OA. This makes it possible to cache certain OA items so they won't have to be reloaded every time. Compression. This will allow you to compress the traffic. Pre-authentication, which is an interesting one since TMG has been dropped by Microsoft, will give you the ability to pre-authenticate users before giving them access to your servers. And the last one, service aware. Load balancers are service aware, so they will verify if this service is really up before sending traffic to the server. Let's have a look at some essential components. First we start with the service. The service has its own persistence, distribution, timeout and SSL offload settings. In the load balancer multiple services can be configured to publish the exchange services. Attached to the service is the virtual IP address. This is the IP address which is used to connect to the service. This VIP address must be unique and can only be bound to one service. Behind those servers, there are servers, nodes or members. Each vendor has its own name for it, so when you look at your load balancer, you might see either members, servers or nodes. Each of them can be assigned to one or more services. Persistence. Persistence is very important in the load balancer. By using persistence, we can ensure that traffic is sent to the same server. When we do not use persistence, every connection might be sent to another server, which will cause a lot of more network traffic. Persistence is also known as affinity or stickiness. There are several types of persistence. We've got source IP, where the persistence depends on the source IP where the traffic is coming from. HTTP cookie, in this case the load balancer will insert a cookie in the HTTP header and use the HTTP cookie to identify the session. We can use the SSL ID which is generated during the session for persistence or we can generate a hash which is used for persistence. Distribution. Using distribution we can load balance the traffic among the several servers. 
There are several types of distribution. Using distribution, we can distribute the traffic among the several servers which are behind the load balancer. There are several types of distribution. Round robin, which uses a round robin mechanism to distribute the load. Weighted round robin, which is the same as round robin but has the advantage that it looks at the weight which is put on a server. Least connections, this will put traffic to the server which has the least connections. One remark must be made about the least connections. This can introduce some issues when rebooting a cache server which gets a lot of connections after reboot while the boot process is still in progress. Several vendors have implemented a solution for this in their product. And least response time uses the server with the quickest response time. SSL offloading. With SSL offloading, we will terminate the SSL session on the load balancer. This makes it possible to look into the package, which is not possible when the package is encrypted. As another advantage, the processor utilization, which is needed on the client access server to decrypt the SSL traffic, is now performed by the load balancer. So the processor utilization on the client access server will decrease. It is possible to use SSL between the load balancer and exchange. In this case, traffic from the client to the load balancer will be encrypted, the load balancer will decrypt it and will re-encrypt it and send it to the exchange server. SSL offloading means smart persistence. We can use multiple types of persistence instead of when we do not use SSL offloading. When we do not use SSL offloading, we can only use two types of persistence source IP persistence and SSL session ID persistence. Layer 4 or layer 7. These are common terms which are used in the load balancer world. Layer 4 acts on the network layer and acts upon the data found in the network and transport layer protocols. Layer 4 load balancing is less resource intensive and thus results in a better performance. Layer 7 load balancing acts on layer 7 of the OSI model. Layer 7 load balancing is application aware, so it needs to have a look in the packages which are transported via the load balancer. Because it needs to inspect those packages, it requires that you use the decrypting of SSL traffic, also known as SSL offloading. The next important thing is routing options. There are several routing options available. The first one, source address network translation, also called called SNET. By using source address network translation, we modify the source address of the package. Using SNET has a disadvantage that it hides the client IP address. So when you look at the logging, the IP address of the load balancer and not the actual IP address of the client. This is sometimes difficult when troubleshooting an issue. The next option is load balancer default gateway. By using this option, we will point the server to have the load balancer's FIP as the default gateway. And last, the most complicated one, direct server return. In this case, the requests only pass through the load balancer. So all traffic is passed through the load balancer, traffic destined to exchange and from exchange to the client. This requires a local loopback interface on the server side, so you will need to install a local loopback interface on the server. One important remark is that the local loopback interface must not answer the ARP requests. The local loopback interface is configured with the FIP of the load balancer and uses layer 4. But as discussed, direct server return is the most complex routing option to use. So now we know the basics. What configuration options are possible? The first one is one-armed. In a one-armed configuration, the FIP is in the same subnet as the clients and the servers. We are bound to use two routing options, either SNET or direct server return. Let's have a look at an example. Our environment has an Outlook client, a load balancer and an exchange server. The first package has a source IP, the client IP 
and will be sent to the VIP of the load balancer. The load balancer will replace the source IP with its own IP and will send it to Exchange. Exchange also answers to th this IP address. When the package arrives at the load balancer, the load balancer will change the source IP again and will forward the packet to the client. The second option to configure your load balancer is using a two-armed configuration. This configuration requires two networks and that the exchange servers are placed in a separate VLAN. In a two-armed configuration, we've got two routing options, either load balancer default gateway or direct server return. Let's have a look at an example. This is the same as the previous one, as the one-armed. The only difference is that the exchange servers are located in a separate VLAN. As you can see, the load balancer now has two VIPs, one on the client side and one on the server side. Let's have a look what happens if we send a package. The client sends the package to the load balancer with its own source IP and the destination IP, which is the load balancer's VIP. The second packet is sent via the other network to the exchange server, where the source IP is replaced by the VIP of the load balancer. Exchange responds back to the VIP of the load balancer. And finally, the package is delivered to the client. Here the load balancer replaces the source IP with the VIP address located in the client VLAN. Now we had a look at the load balancing essentials, let's start with Exchange 2010. Which roles can be load balanced by the load balancer? Well, there are three roles which we can load balance. The client access server, the hub transport server and the edge transport server and this is only inbound traffic. The last one is a little bit strange because we can also use load balancing using MX records. But using a load balancer to load balance the inbound SMTP traffic has some advantages. Think of the health checks which can be performed by the load balancer. So which workloads can we load balance? Well, in Exchange 2010 we have got several workloads. We can load balance Outlook anywhere, Outlook MAPI traffic, Outlook web app and, exchange, and the Exchange control panel traffic, Exchange web services, the address book service, ActiveSync, POP, IMAP and remote PowerShell. Now we have looked at which workloads we can load balance, we also need to have a look at which persistence type is needed for each workload. There are workloads where persistence is required, recommend and not required. There are workloads where the persistence is required. This means that you need to implement persistence. In some cases, it might be recommend to implement persistence. We will have a look at each workload and I will explain why the persistence is required or recommended. The first workload is the OWA ECP. When using form-based authentication for both OWA and ECP, each request, must, each request must be sent to the same client access server. The, first look at the OWA ECP. When using form-based authentication for both OWA and ECP, all requests must be sent to the same client access server. This because they share the same authentication cookie and this cookie can only be decrypted by one specific client access server. For this workload you can either use source IP or cookie based. The source IP can of course only be used if you have a large IP range. If you decide to use source IP you could decide to disable SSL offloading. If you are planning to use cookie based affinity it is a requirement to enable SSL offloading. The second workload is Outlook Anywhere. Here we see both required and recommended. Required is only applicable 
to intranet connections only. When using Outlook Anywhere using the intranet, Outlook uses multiple sessions per user and assumes that all sessions connect to the same server. When connected via the internet, Outlook sets up two HTTP connections, one for incoming data and one for outgoing data. When no affinity is used, Outlook Anywhere will try to correlate the connections by coordinating with other members of the CAS array. This increases traffic between the client access server by about 50% for a two array server and up to 100% for an array with a large number of servers. The next workload is ActiveSync. As you all may know, ActiveSync uses a long-standing HTTP requ request from the client to the server. So when an ActiveSync client needs to connect to a new server, it must recreate the notification subscription against the user's mailbox. This will result in a significant performance penalty on the client access server. Remote PowerShell workload. Maybe you won't load balance it, but some people decide to load balance remote PowerShell. By using the persistence for this workload, you will prevent that the user has to re-authenticate if a connection was interrupted, which of course is not something you really want. To prevent re-authentication, just enable the persistence and set it to cookie-based. Both Autodiscover and the offline address book, also known as the OAP, do not require persistence. After the transaction has completed, the connection will be broken. The RPC client access workload. Here we see that the persistence type is set to required. This is also valid for the RPC endpoint mapper. When connecting via the internet, Outlook uses multiple sessions per user and assumes that all sessions connect to the same server. So all RPC client access and endpoint mapper sessions need to be to the same client access server. The persistence type used for this is the source IP. The address book service. Here you see that the persistence type is set to recommended. But why does it need to be recommended? When you don't use affinity, it will result in a significantly higher level of communication between the client and the client access server. So it will cause a performance impact on the client access server. Also, here we use the persistence type source IP. pop and IMAP, they're still used in some environments, but they both don't require persistence. This because when a transaction has completed, the connection will be broken. Using persistence will not have any benefit for the performance. So now we know which servers we can load balance, which workloads we can load balance, and which persistence is required per workload. Let's have a look at the configuration. We have two options. We can either use a single VIP, where we will publish all protocols via one VIP. All protocols share the same settings. Keep in mind that this is not valid for all vendors. When using a single VIP, layer 7 needs to be used to determine the destination. Using multiple VIPs, protocols can be assigned to their own VIP. By doing this, you have the ability to assign specific settings per VIP, so per protocol. Let's have a look at the pros and cons of both single VIP and multiple VIPs. Single VIP is easy to configure. You only need to create one rule and you're finished. As advantage, you only need two fully qualified domain names to publish the services. When using multiple VIPs, you have the option to allow scale out via scale up. So you have the option to expand your environment really easy without much work. Besides this, you will have some additional statistics and logging options. This might be required in some scenarios. When using multiple FIPS, you can segment client traffic. And what we mean with segmenting client traffic is the, that we can segment the workloads. So we can separate the workloads to better load balance. By using multiple FIPS, we can also define better persistence. This because we can define the persistence per protocol. 
die disadvantage of multiple FIPS is that it requires multiple IP addresses. Another advantage of multiple FIPS is that we can offer availability per protocol. This means that if one protocol goes down, the rest of the protocols can still be sent to the server. Besides configuring the load balancer to load balance exchange, you will also need to configure exchange. The first step is to configure the CAS array. The CAS array is an object which is created per site and contains all client access servers within that site. A fully qualified domain name is assigned to the CAS array and the clients will connect to the FQDN of the CAS array to connect to their mailbox. The second step is to configure static ports for RPC based services. You can either do this by using the registry editor or by using PowerShell. The third step is to configure the virtual directory settings. We will have a closer look at those in the next slide. And as last step, configure SSL offloading. This can be either done manually or via our script. The virtual directory settings. As you can see, they're divided in three columns. Internal URL, external URL internet facing, external URL non-internet facing. First look at the internal URL column. As you can see, the internal URL for OA is set to the server FQDN. All other internal URLs are set to the NLB FQDN. In this case, the NLB FQDN is the FQDN assigned to the FIP. The external URL internet facing column needs to contain the FQDN of the NLB. This is for all virtual directories. When having a non-internet facing CAS server, you will need to leave the external URL empty. The URLs you are configuring here will be provided to the auto-discover servers when a client does an auto-discover lookup. So it's time for our first demo. In this demo, we will configure the load balancer. The load balancer already contains an IP and will be configured in a one-armed configuration and will use SSL offloading. The exchange servers are already configured with the correct URLs. Okay, let's start with the demo. As you can see, we've got a camp loadmaster here. So we're using the camp loadmaster to load balance our exchange 2010 environment. Uh, the first thing we need to check is the network interface settings. Select system configuration and select ETH0. As you can see, it's already configured with an IP address in the same subnet as the clients and servers. The HTH0 is the first NIC in the load balancer. Next step is to import the certificate. Select SSL certificate, import certificate, browse to the certificate exported from the exchange server. One thing is important here is that the certificate must contain the private key, else the certificate can't be used. So we browse to the directory where the certificate is exported. Provide the password, which is used to protect the private key. And specify an identifier, in this case a change. And press save. Certificate is now successfully imported, so we can add the virtual services. Click Add New. We specify an IP address for the virtual server. Next is the port. We change it to 443 because that's the port that we use to uh, publish the services. And as the last thing, we specify the service name, in this case exchange, HTTPS. The camp load balancer contains several templates which can be used to configure the virtual services. As you can see, almost for every protocol, there's a template available. Since we want to 
logons HTTPS, we select Exchange HTTPS and press the Add the Virtual Service button. When we look at every option, we will see that every setting is configured correctly, so we don't have to make a lot of changes. Maybe you have to change the persistence option if you like. And one thing we need to change later on is the SSL option. But let's first add the real servers. Provide the IP address of the server. So in this case, 51. Change the port to 80 because we want to use SSL offloading and press at this real server. Perform the same task for the other server. Now we can use view modified services or either statistics or real services to view the status of the service. As you can see, it has added the virtual service, but it still uses the certificate which is installed on the server, which is incorrect. The real servers are giving the current status. It might take some time before the correct status is displayed, but it will be a few seconds. So let's first change the certificate part because that's not correct. Select modify, scroll down and enable the SSL option. You will get a warning, but you have to accept it. So press OK. Scroll down again. Press add new. From the drop down menu, select the correct virtual service and click Add VS. When we now go back to View Modified Service, we see that it uses the certificate which is installed on the load balancer. And also, the states of both real servers have been updated. Now, this virtual service is OK we can add the additional virtual services for RPC. Press Add New. As you can see in the template list, there are no RPC services listed. So we need to configure them manually. So add the virtual IP address, which is the same as for the previous virtual service, but change the port number. Remember, we talked about changing the port number for RPC and the RPC endpoint mapper. But before doing this, we need to import two registries files. I created registry files containing the valid port numbers which I want to use. So this one is for the address book RPC service so I will put it in here, put a description here, and press at this virtual service. Remember, you might need to set the correct persistence type. Press add new, and add the IP addresses of the services. Repeat the same step for the other server. And select your modify services. Remember, it might take a while before the real server status is updated. As you can see, it just updated and the second server is not configured correctly. So let's first fix that. So we go to the server, double click the file, import it, and the most important step is that you will need to restart both the MS Exchange address book servers 
and the RPC client access service. So go to services. And select the MS Exchange address book service first. Restart it. Wait till it has restarted. Next, select the RPC client access. Also restart that one. And the new settings should be active. So let's add the last virtual service, the RPC endpoint mapper. Provide the same virtual IP address. Change the port to the pre-configured one in the registry. Change the name. Don't use the template and press add this virtual service. Add the real service. and verify the status in the view modifier services. Now we have configured the load balancer, let's verify if it works. I've opened Outlook web app. And I will try to log on as the administrator because that's the only user I have in my test environment currently. And after a short while, OWA will open. When we go back to the GAMP load balancer, we have the ability to check the statistics. Here we can see how much traffic is sent to a specific server. So in this case, all traffic is sent to the first exchange server. Now we have to look how to configure load balancing for Exchange 2010. Let's have a look how we can configure load balancing for Exchange 2013. First, we have a look at some differences. What is different compared to Exchange 2010? The first thing which is different is that session affinity is not longer required. So we don't have to use affinity. The second big difference is that SSL offloading is not supported. Microsoft has announced that SSL offloading is not supported. But maybe we will see this back in the future. Layer 7 load balancing is not longer required. We can use layer 4 load balancing to load balance or exchange 2013 environment. And as last difference, only the cost needs to be load balanced. What's the same? Well, the workloads. We still have the ability to load balance the same workloads. There are also some new options. For example, the health check per workload. The health check per workload is a check which can be performed per web service and uses the healthcheck.htm. If the service is running, you will get back a status 200 OK. If not, the service simply won't respond. Also in Exchange 2013, we have the ability to use a single VIP or use multiple VIPs. As we already discussed them with Exchange 2010, we will go briefly to them. Single VIP, all protocols are published via one IP. All protocols share the same settings. Keep in mind that this might differ per vendor. Layer 7 needs to be used to determine the destination. Multiple VIPs, protocols can be assigned to their own VIP. Specific protocols can be assigned their own settings. So how to configure Exchange? Well, first we need to configure the virtual directory settings. And as last thing, we need to configure the auto discover internal URI. This last one to load balance auto discover when clients connect via the SAP, the service connection point. Okay, it's time for demo two, configuring the load balancer. We already configured the load balancer 
with IPs. We will configure this time in a two-armed configuration, so we have two separate VLANs. Since Exchange 2013 doesn't support SSL offloading, we can't configure SSL offloading. For this demo, we also use the GAMP load master. But in this case, we need to ensure that the second NIC is configured. In this case, the second NIC is configured with an IP address which is located in the server LAN. ETH0 is configured in the client VLAN. Let's add some services. We will need to add the services manually because CAMP doesn't provide a template for this currently. Provide an IP address and a port number and a name which is used to identify the virtual service. Press add this virtual service. Okay, now comes an important one. We need to accept the default force L7 option. This may sound strange, but since we don't have a certificate installed and assigned to the virtual service, it will fill back to layer 4. The L7 transparency needs to be unchecked. If we don't do this, we might get issues with connections, so please uncheck it. Persistence options, leave it set to none, which is the default, because Exchange 2013 doesn't care about persistence anymore. Here comes an interesting rule. You can automatically add a redirect rule from port 80 to 443. So let's check that option. Now it's time to define the health check rules. The port we want to check is port 443. And the URL. This is something new. We talked about the health check.htm. This is the URL we want to check. By this URL we will make sure that exchange is available and no uh, traffic is sent to the server it's it, if it's not reachable. Check option. Set it to get. And continue with adding the real servers. That's done. Click on view modify services and you will see the first rule is a redirect rule. So it will redirect traffic from port 80 to port 443 and both servers will accept traffic. Since we want to assign multiple VIPs to the load balancer, we will need to create separate virtual services. So what I did is I prepared the config so I will need to restore the config. Restore configuration. It's restored. When we now go back to virtual services, we will see separate virtual services per workload. OWA has its own. AWS has its own. The offline address book has its own. ActiveSync has its own, Outlook Anywhere has its own, AutoDiscover has its own, and this last one, SMTP. So let's verify if it really works, because that's the most important thing. One important remark must be made, and that is that you set the default gateway of the exchange servers to the VIP of the load balancer, else it simply won't work. So we will log in with the administrator account and you will see that Outlook Web App works. We can go to the options. Which will open the options. When we have a look at the load balancer now, we can go to statistics 
real servers, you will see that there are some connections spread around the servers. This has to do, this is a result of some previous testing I've performed. When we look at the virtual services, we see that the OWA HTTPS rule is the only rule we are hitting at this moment. That's because we don't have used Outlook to connect. If you will use Outlook to connect, you will see that the numbers will raise for all other rules. So a short summary. Load balancing will give you a lot of new options. Think of maintenance, the easiness to expand your environment, the high availability you will have. You can use both single or multiple FIPS to load balance your exchange environment. Keep in mind that persistence is really important. Have a look at the Microsoft documentation, but also check the documentation which is delivered by the load balancer vendors. SSL offloading is not supported with Exchange 2013. And when using Layer 7 load balancing, you can only use it when using SSL offloading. So, we come to the end of the presentation. I hope you liked it. Uh, if you've got any questions, leave them as a comment below. Uh, comments will be closed after 40 days, so you will have to uh, send your questions within 40 days. Else, feel free to contact me directly, it's no problem. If you enjoyed this presentation, please tweet, like, or share it with your friends and peers. And last but not least, don't forget to look at the exchangevirtualconference.com website for more presentations.